So hi, uh, hello and welcome again. Uh, welcome to another uh, microscopy live stream. Um, yeah, as always, I do hope uh, that you're able to hear and see me properly. If not, I'd like to kindly request uh, that you write a short comment. Uh, uh, but uh, today I'd like uh, to do um, again a question and answer session, um, a Q&A session. I've already done this before. It was, uh, I think, uh, pretty successful. And if you have any questions uh, that are microscopy related, please post them into the chat. And I've already received a few questions today that I would like uh, to address. Um, yeah, and I've also prepared a few questions here that I might uh, answer, but of course I'm going to give those questions in the chat a priority. Now, um, what I would like to also say is that if you have any uh, yeah, questions that you would like uh, to pose uh, yeah, for future videos, then please, um, after the video is, uh, after the live stream, the video will be available online. And then in the comments section, you can also um, write down questions. I'm going to read all of the comments and then I'm going to uh, try to answer them. Now, if uh, I do not answer some of your questions that you pose in the chat, that you type in into the chat, please uh, don't feel too bad about it uh, because uh, I might not know the answers to all of them. Sometimes I get very specific questions and uh, then I'm not able to, to answer them. Then I'm simply going to ignore it. Maybe I'm going to pick up uh, on that later, but please uh, don't uh, feel too upset about this. Yeah, so yes, um, the f I'd like to do the following um, is I'm going to go directly into the chat. And uh, even before the start of this live stream, there was a question here. Um, and can you tell me how to um, have a colony of bacteria, how to make bacterial colonies? And because I got this question already over half an hour ago, I was actually able to prepare a little video. Um, and uh, what I would like to simply say here is, is in advance is, is I think personally that it is not a good idea to grow bacteria at home uh, because sometimes you don't know what you're growing and uh, it can be indeed a health hazard if you have a small wound for example and then you get some of the bacteria into the wound so um I think it's not a good idea. I think um, it's also not necessary for a microscopy if you want to do hobby microscopy to grow bacteria, but still I'm going to tell you how this is done, okay? Because um, you know, it's an educational channel and I'm going to switch over now to a, a video of a couple of pictures that I made over here. So you need a whole bunch of equipment here. <laughs> it's probably more than you actually need, but the really important thing is, is you need to have yeast extract and a substance called agar agar. And you mix it together uh, with water, um, yeah, and you uh, boil it for about 30 minutes in a pressure cooker. Uh, this will dissolve the agar agar and it will um, also kill all of the bacteria, contaminants that are in there. And then you can make a petri dish. Now the video is going to loop, so you're going to just see it again if this was a little bit too quick here. Yeah, so um, the um, agar agar is all the way in the bottom. Yeast extract is important. You weigh it. Um, there are certain recipes uh, that uh, you can use. Um, and you mix the agar agar with uh, the yeast extract in those uh, flasks. And uh, then everything goes uh, yeah, into a pressure cooker for about half an hour. Um, something that I did not show here now is you have to pour those plates. So you have to uh, buy those uh, plastic Petri dishes. And this one over here, um, I'm going to quickly pause this video here. Oh, um, unfortunately, it's too far. I'm going to pause the video over here. Um, this is um, still not paused. Okay, um, this here is now a Petri dish that actually shows th those bacterial colonies, doesn't pause. Um, and um, this means that a bacterial colony um, are probably, I don't know, millions or if not billions of individual bacteria that all have grown out of one individual bacterium because of bacteria, they divide um, exponentially. And, and then um, after, um, yeah, maybe about a, a day or so, you're going to see those bacterial colonies. So we're talking about a very, very high concentration um, of bacteria here. Um, yeah, so those uh, little dots that you see here, um, yeah, on the other side, yeah, um, are basically individual colonies. And the other yellow thing that you see those uh, streaked outlines, um, the bacteria are so dense that you cannot even see the individual colonies. Yeah. And then if you take, of course, a small sample of that and put it under the microscope, then you're going to see, I don't know, millions of bacteria. But again, um, when you take now a water sample and do that, you're going to find different colonies of different sizes, colors, and so on, shapes even. But again, I would not do that because you don't know what you're growing. And strictly speaking, um, yeah, it's an elevated safety category. Yeah. So, um, but if you feel that, uh, yeah, I'm just saying uh, ready-made Petri dishes can also be bought over Amazon. So I'm just saying, but uh, generally I would uh, kind of uh, advise to be here careful a little bit here. Yeah, I'm going to um, also, um, 
always go back to the comments here and read some of them out. Yeah, I accidentally grew bacteria on my Petri dish. I was trying to culture ciliates. I was not using agar, agar, just water and a few droplets of milk. Well, yes, um, as a matter of fact, uh, anything uh, that is organic, uh, milk, for example, also vegetables, it doesn't matter, um, can be used and is used as food for bacteria. And essentially what happens is you're spoiling the food. And if you let milk stand out um, yeah, in the open, unrefrigerated, bacteria are going to start growing. Same with uh, pretty much anything when food spoils. A lot of bacteria are growing. And of course, that's uh, one of the reasons why you don't want to eat those. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so and so this is um, I'm just going to read some more of these here. Um, yeah, about water samples. It's the next one. Yeah. So uh, basically, it's, uh, what I would like to say is, is if you are interested in observing bacteria, because sometimes you would want to test your microscope because bacteria are quite small and uh, not very colorful, transparent, and you might actually want to kind of test your microscope a little bit. How, I, am I able to see the bacteria? And I highly recommend that you buy yourself uh, a so-called uh, uh, yeah, a, a freeze-dried bacteria over Amazon that are used for making yogurt, so-called yogurt cultures. And they contain um, different bacterial species, freeze-dried. And what you do is you take, take a tiny sample of this and mix it with water and put this water droplet on the microscope yeah so you have a concentrated amount of bacteria but those bacteria are safe and, and then you can still see uh, them uh, and then you know how bacteria look like or at least uh, some of them and so I, I would say there are also easier ways um, and uh, yeah uh, to do that if you want to see bacteria so play play the safe way my, my suggestion okay so um, I'm going to move on here because there are um, yeah a few more questions here. Do you keep any water samples long term, or do you return or dispose them directly after observing them? Thank you for the question. <laughs> That's a thing that um, I have to answer with uh, both. Um, so and the next question is is what what is long term? Um, I go out. I collect water samples um, and um, yeah usually in plastic little plastic containers with a screw cap um, on them. You've already seen them before I'm going to reach over. Okay, here, for example, those, uh, yeah, yeah, they're quite, quite useful. I think they have a scoop and I usually uh, carry them home in those containers. And then what I do at home is, is I open the container and I pour it out into, um, into glass jars. Just a second. Yeah. Like, like, like these here. Okay. You know what? I'm going to just switch over to the desk view. Okay. Um, and the reason is, is because it cannot tip over uh, yeah, so easily and there is air. So this means that uh, the plants in here, they basically can get oxygen as well. Um, and um, I leave it like this and I can keep it for weeks. And then what's going to happen is, is the water is going to evaporate and I always keep on adding a little bit of water. I do not want to add too much water because it's going to kind of shock uh, the microorganisms osmotically, you know. Um, so I always um, add a little bit of water um, when it evaporates. Um, and I've kept those already for months. Um, of course, uh, the, 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 the organisms are going to change over time obviously because uh, it's, it's not going to stay the same you know some sometimes certain organisms start to multiply more or less depending on also whether um, on the temperature maybe um, and a variety of other factors um, but sometimes what i do is is uh, the uh, the following is, is if i have uh, some uh, some organisms on my microscope slide some nice worms and so on I, 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 even though it's a very small amount i, I actually do return them yeah um, yeah why I don't know. Yeah, uh, I just uh, feel that. Yeah, I just want to put them back. Um, and what about those here? Well, um, theoretically, I could flush it down the toilet. I have done this already, also. <laughs> then it's back in water. Um, but it's probably not. They're not probably not going to survive. And sometimes um, I can also return them, of course, um, if uh, the pond is is nearby. Yeah. But then what I do not do, and um, it's probably not going to have a, a large impact, but I, I generally do, don't think it's a good idea to kind of mix water samples. So if I take it out of one pond, I'm not going to return it to another pond uh, because I'm transferring organisms this way. Now, I don't think that this is going to make a huge difference because when birds are flying and, and, and yeah, then of course they're also transferring organisms around. But, but simply out of principle, I'm, I don't do that. Yeah. Um, so... Yeah, sometimes uh, I forget about them and when they are dry, then I simply have to clean it out. Yeah, So this is um, um, a little bit of a, a thing here that, um, um, that uh, yeah, 
I can keep them for, for quite a, a long time. And as a matter of fact, um, there have been questions about uh, winter microscopy because what about the water samples during winter time? Um, uh, well, that's actually one possibility. You collect water samples in, in, in fall maybe, and then you try to keep it um, yeah, like this uh, over the next couple of, uh, of months. Okay, I'm going to put it away, otherwise it's gonna fall over. And I'm gonna go back again to the questions here, okay? Um, and the next question here, if you do keep uh, water samples long-term, what's the best way to dispose of them? Yeah, if they go bad. Um, or bleach in the sample. Well, um, I get the idea with bleach because when they turn bad, what's gonna happen is, and I, I, I've already done this before, <laughs> accidentally. What I've done is I collected water samples over the holidays. Maybe you've seen some of the videos that I made in France in my, uh, my other channel. And I put a, a, a screw cap on it and um, I kept it closed for a week, one and a half weeks, and it turned bad. Um, yeah, you, you know it turns bad when you open it and when it starts to smell bad, sulfury. Um, it became anaerobic bacteria started to grow. Um, there are a lot of bacteria in there. Yeah. Um, so what I do is, is I flush it down the toilet. Uh, I try not to touch it. Bleach, of course, would also work. Uh, hydrogen peroxide, of course, would also work. But bleach and also chlorine containing bleach is also not good for the environment. And considering the fact that there are so many bacteria in sewage water anyway, um, I just flush it down the toilet. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and uh, because it's a decomposition, it's happening anyway. Yeah. Um, so this is, uh, yeah, the, yeah some, some simply some, the way that I'm doing it, I'm not saying that, that this is the only way. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, another couple of comments here. Um, yeah, personally, I, I used some alcohol and disposed of it. Yes, but be aware of the following, that if you use alcohol, um, as soon as you mix it with water, in here, uh, the alcohol is going to be diluted. Generally, for disinfecting, you need 70% alcohol. So this means you need to add about two-thirds more of the liquid than you, that you have of alcohol uh, for it to, to be actually be... Uh, active as a disinfectant. 70% alcohol is the thing that uh, we used in microbiology labs for disinfecting. And of course, if you've got a lot of water, you have to add about, uh, I don't know, twice the amount of alcohol uh, to, to actually get the correct concentration. So it might be actually quite a bit of alcohol that you need. Yeah? In that sense, bleach is more effective. Uh, yeah. So um, so let's have a look uh, here is. Um, Okay, there there's some some uh, some microscope uh, some microscope um, uh, questions here, but I want to go a little bit uh, about the back to the question about the winter microscopy, uh, because this is actually a, indeed an issue in some countries, um, also where I live in in Central Europe. Um, of course, we want to do microscopy also over winter time. And uh, when we collect pond water samples, it can be difficult. I found it difficult because sometimes the ponds are frozen, <laughs> obviously. Um, and uh, when you actually manage to make a hole into the ice and collect some water, you're not going to find a lot of water microorganisms. There are not so many in the water body anyway. Um, so you have to do the following, get some leaves, some decomposing leaves from, from fall that kind of maybe settled on the, the, the ground of, 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 of the pond and, and take a few of those uh, together with a water sample and then let it stand in a jar like this for a couple of days. Um, the microorganisms that are there, which are at very low concentration because it's winter, they will start to increase in numbers. Um, and then you can actually use this as a sample. Yeah. So um, this is, uh, so generally I have not had problems uh, during winter time. Um, also because uh, you simply have to look at the right place and the right place is not the water itself, but actually the sediment. Yeah. Because this is uh, where um, many of the microorganisms are, not, yeah, not in the same amount as during in summer, of course, uh, but uh, this can be managed by simply letting it stand um, for a couple of days at room temperature, mm -hmm. I found. Yeah. So um, yeah, I go on here um, with uh, the, some of the questions. Yeah. Um, wow, there is, I have to see where I am. Um, there is the next one is a um, is a, um, a microscope uh, a question here about the Swift Stellar One. Uh, one Pro T is uh, about six hundred US dollars in the Stellar four thirty. Do you think the Pro is worth the extra money? I will need to observe water uh, dwelling bacteria. Okay, 
Um, so this is a specific uh, question about two very similar microscopes. Um, so there is uh, the company, and I made reviews uh, of this microscope, okay? And um, it's about this, this microscope name is called the Swift Stellar One, and it comes in two versions. One is the pro version, that's the one that I reviewed, and the other one is the, non the normal version. Um, and the question is, is it really worth the additional money? And um, I'm saying it's that's difficult to say. Um, I would say the image quality, I mean, I've not looked at through the other uh, microscope, through the non-pro microscope, but the optics uh, um, will not be so different. No, it's uh, Plan optics is the pro one and it's infinity, but that alone does not really make a huge difference. Um, I would probably say that for general observation, you'll be fine, completely fine with the, the non-pro version. And as of this time, at least, the non-pro version, in my view, does have a somewhat of an advantage. And that is because it is non-infinity, it is the traditional 160 millimeter, um, therefore it, it is easier to find objectives. Okay, um, so the non-pro version you can, if you want to have uh, other objectives like a 20 times, um, then it's much more easily possible to find uh, those, or maybe also over AliExpress from China. Um, and for the uh, pro version, um, you need infinity objectives. And I had contacted the company, um, and they did not have, uh, for example, a 20 times or 60 times uh, infinity objective for the Stellar Pro. And so this is actually a, a yeah. It, it, I think a disadvantage, at least um, as of this point, maybe they're going to start introducing this in, in, in the future. Yeah. So, um, and I think that I, while I've not checked, uh, looked through the the the, the, reg, the, the non-pro version, um, I think that the image quality will not be so different. Okay. I mean, the pro has plan objectives. That, that's pretty nice, but for all practical purposes, um, I think you'll be also fine with the other one. Okay. So. Um, so how do you think is the new size uh, uh, Primo Star 3? Um, honestly, I, I only, um, I don't know, I have not looked at it in detail. Uh, I have to be very honest, the size Prim Primo Star 3, but honestly, come on, size, Leica, <laughs> what, what do you want? I mean, these are for sure excellent microscopes. I mean, um, I think uh, the name already, the brand already speaks for itself. And I would say that if you're kind of already shopping um, um, at this level, uh, then I would say uh, what you have to do is, is um, yeah, uh, I know it's difficult because you cannot try it out yourself, but that this is, this is already so expensive those microscopes that and that I would say um, you have to feel comfortable yourself using those. So you have to really go in and dig in into the specifications and really think about it um, uh, yourself whether the microscope meets your own uh, meets your own needs. With the lower cost uh, amateur microscopes, I mean, yeah, you've lost maybe a couple of if you're not satisfied with it, maybe a couple of hundred dollars or euros you can live with that. But if you buy yourself really a brand microscope, it can really be quite expensive. And I think in this case, um, it's really a highly individual decision that you have to make here. Yeah. Um, does nature have a color? <laughs> That's a philosophical question. <laughs> um, the question is, is if there is a tree falling and nobody hears it, is there a sound? Well, um, nature does have different wave, uh, the different wavelengths are emitted, um, obviously. And uh, the microscope, uh, of course, uh, is uh, able to magnify the image and then we interpret, our brain interprets the colors. Yeah? So one of the things is, I'm, uh, there's, um, I think I've already seen that in the f for future, somehow for future um, uh, uh, yeah, live streams, I have, somehow I have to figure out how I'm able to project the, the comments into the actual video. I cannot do that yet. So I'm always reading this off and if, um, yeah, so I, I hope this is okay, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, what of your thoughts of lights or plan microscope? Um, wasn't lights bought up by Leica many years ago? Uh, I think, yeah. Uh, Leica and lights, uh, uh, yeah, same uh, brand. Yeah, high, high quality brands. Yeah, but otherwise, um, I don't know them as um, as well. Yeah, also, all of those uh, companies are are very good. Yeah. Um, 
Have you uh, tried hunting cable bacteria? Honestly, I don't know what they are. I'd have to research this. Can you centrifuge to isolate more protists or will it destroy their membranes? If so, what's the ideal RPM? If you uh, centrifuge organisms too quickly, then the high G forces indeed, and maybe some searing forces indeed are uh, pro or might maybe destroy them. Um, I can imagine this. Um, I don't know. Um, I don't know what the ideal RPM is. This is indeed something I'd have to try out. I do have a very cheap centrifuge um, as well. But what I've uh, done with the problem with uh, some protists is, for example, certain paramecia um, or other moving ones is, is you, you centrifuge them, but then you have to be really quick in removing the top water. Otherwise, because they're moving around, they're actually going to spread again. Yeah. Um, yeah. Next question, I found amoeba in a pretty weird environment. I left water for one month in my balcony and put it under the microscope. There were a lot of amoeba. Yes, um, the some, this is actually quite possible. So some conditions, environmental conditions, favor certain organisms. So for example, in this very water sample over here that I uh, let stand, by the way, that's going to be a new video that I'm going to just release very quickly in my other channel. All of a sudden, I found a lot of spirilla in this, uh, yeah, in, in this water sample, a lot of spirilla, spiral-shaped bacteria, which you have not found to that ex uh, extent in other water samples. So it depends on the, uh, on the food that is present, may, uh, maybe on the temperature, on the oxygen concentration, yeah? maybe, maybe a certain predators that are present, and then this can actually favor certain microorganisms. Yeah? Harder to uh, resell full-priced high-end scopes. So if you want something good uh, to last uh, your lifetime. Um, so the question is that that's an interesting one. If you buy yourself a very high-priced microscope, um, then they have a very good resale value. Uh, but it might also be more difficult to sell them yeah, because... Um, yeah, maybe people or, or companies or universities or so what they're going to do, they just might buy it directly from, um, from the original company. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, how to differentiate between protists and rotifers? They look uh, alike to me. Well, rotifers uh, generally are multicellular and uh, yeah, sometimes a little bit larger than some protists. You have to use an identification book. This is the identification book that I use. It's an old edition. Yes, it is in German, okay, but this doesn't matter uh, because there are drawings in there, okay? I'm just going to quickly flip through here because of copyright, okay? And uh, those drawings um, uh, help you identify the organism. Then when you know the name, uh, then you type in the name into Google and you look for a picture for confirming. And this actually worked uh, quite well for me, okay? Um, hello, Oliver. I have a question about oil immersion. I saw it possible to put oil between the slide and the condenser as well. Do you have any experience with that? Is it safe? Is it better? Um, yes. <laughs> okay. You know what? I've, I've got actually in preparation here um, in my little box. Let's pull out a condenser. Okay. Um, I've not done this yet. And um, yeah, and I don't want to risk it. Um, I'll be honest with you. Okay, so um, normally, yeah, I'll have, have an old slide over here as well. Difficult to see. What normally what you do is, is you put a drop of oil um, on the um, on the um, sl um, yeah, sl yeah cover glass slide. This here is not an oil immersion objective. Okay, you can only use it with a one that says oil. Okay, but then what happens is you're dipping the tip uh, into the oil so that there is, yeah, the, the, the front part's gonna be covered with oil. So there is no air between the, the specimen and, and, uh, and the lens. So these are oil tight. They're actually made in such a way that you can do that. Yeah? Um, however, um, it is uh, also possible to, um, to put uh, a droplet of oil over here on the condenser. So at the stages on here, and then there is actually um, oil also between, between the condenser and the slide. I've never done this and I'm not going to risk it because I don't know um, if the condenser is oil tad or not, okay? Um, but this uh, um, yeah, can actually also increase uh, the resolution. Yeah? So far, I've not found it necessary, um, but uh, yeah, it's not for me personally, it's not worth the hassle. I'd have to clean everything again. Uh, if there's oil on there, uh, it becomes sticky, dust is able to settle more and, more and, and, and so on. Yeah? So for me, it's not worth the hassle, but yes, it is. Um, I have heard of, of um, also condensers where you can put a drop of oil um, on it, but I only would do that if it is actually maybe documented um, that you're, you can do that. I don't know if it's oil tight or not, okay? So, um, I go on here. 
Um, Cable bacteria are, are electrically conduct, uh, conductive multicellular strings of cells. Imagine, okay, interesting. Um, yeah, I, I know of magneto, uh, magnetic bacteria, magnetotactic bacteria, but never heard of, uh, of, of those cable bacteria. Can you recommend a handbook in English for identifying microorganisms? I don't know one. Uh, no, there are handbooks. Um, you know what? I'll do the research. Um, there are um, online um Maybe maybe I'll I'll post something. Um, there are indeed uh, books, uh, PDFs uh, of books available by um, Mr. Feusner, who was a, a protozoologist, and he made all of his publications available. Um, and there is a a website where you can download uh, for free um, all of his PDFs of all of his books. Okay, Feusner was his name. He was a yeah. He passed away uh, some time ago, uh, but he was one of the uh, a pretty leading uh, protozoologist. Okay, okay. Ah yeah, here is uh, something here. Yeah, yes. Here are some 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 very. Thank you very much for for posting for posting references. Okay, so you know what I'm gonna do. Um, yeah, I'm just going to um, answer some of those uh, questions over here. Yeah, in the hope that they also interest you. I collected them over the. Over the time, and um, there some of the questions uh, do reappear over and over again. Um, and uh, one of the questions is, what's the disadvantage of using a twenty times eyepiece? Okay. Um, so um, basically, um, I just I brought two of them here. This here is a, a ten times eyepiece, and this here is a, a twenty five times eyepiece. And generally, if uh, yeah, in most cases, um, you use the ten times eyepiece. Um, and if you want to um, achieve a certain magnification, you, um, of course, multiply the magnification of the eyepiece with the magnification of the objective. So 10 times 40 in this case gives you 400 times. Um, and you could theoretically achieve the same magnification also by using a um, lower powered uh, objective and a higher powered eyepiece. But the problem with that is, is that the image is more blurry. Yeah, so um, you have the same um, magnification, but it's more blurry. So the question is now, okay, if you actually don't get a better image quality, so what's the point of actually using higher power eyepieces? And um, in some cases, um, if uh, it's simply more comfortable, especially if the specimen is small, and then you're just happy if, if it's bigger, it's a little bit more blurry, but you'll be fine. And it simply covers more of your field of view. Why not? Yeah. So for convenience, um, sometimes you just don't care so much about the, the resolution, but you just say, okay, it's bigger, it's a little, little bit more blurry and, and fine. Um, so this is essentially one advantage. And the second advantage, I, I'll be, I know I'm a little bit um, yeah, not so <laughs> nice now, is, is the uh, companies add those 25 times eyepieces because this way they can sell the microscopes with a larger magnification. So if you see companies that sell microscopes with a 2,500 times magnification, then they have a yeah an objective with 100 times and multiplied by 25, and this really magnifies a lot. However, this is beyond the useful magnification. So it's a marketing thing. Yeah. Um, generally, when looking through those at least lower cost 25 times eyepieces, you already see that the front lens is smaller, so and the eye relief. So you have to really go really close. So I think it's not as, as nice or convenient or comfortable looking through the 25 times eyepiece as through a 10 times. So the short answer is: What use do they have? For me, they don't have any use. Okay, at least the way that I use the microscope. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, sometimes I experiment around with them a little bit, but I do not see any major advantage. If I want to increase the magnification, I switch uh, um, the objective, okay? So um, this is uh, basically uh, one of the questions here. Um, and there are a few more comments here. Do you plan streaming with questions in the future? Uh, why not? Um, a lot depends on, on, on how successful this format is. Um, I started live streaming now a couple, several weeks ago, first on another channel. I called it Micro Hunter Live, but I've got too many channels, so I started to move it back to the to this channel where you're watching it right now. Um, and uh, we'll see how it develops. Um, I don't know if this format is appreciated or not, <laughs> concerning the, considering the fact that there are quite a few questions, I think it is appreciated. Um, I'll continue also making a normal YouTube video and it's a little bit of an experiment um, also to see how, um, yeah, how well this format works. Um, I intend to answer questions in the future as well. 
it's easier in the sense also for me because I don't have to prepare so many things, but it would make life easier for me that if you have any questions and if you somehow um, post them in advance, because uh, then I might be able to prepare a few things. Right? Because right now what you're seeing is, is a pretty boring background with just my tabletop <laughs> um, and me talking and reading off uh, the questions. But uh, I would actually also like to somehow find a way of actually including the questions maybe in the actual video itself. Yeah. I learned so many things with um, with me, Micropondro. Well, thank you very much. Okay, um, can you see? Uh, can you do sea water microscopy if you have a possibility? Yes, as a matter of fact, uh, I didn't tell you yet. Um, I was on the holidays on in northern Germany, uh, near Hamburg, and I collected uh, a little bit of seawater. Um, seawater is not so interesting, but actually the the sand there. Okay, it was uh, in the um, yeah, in the in the there was a in the area of Ham Hamburg, Bussum. For those of you who know northern Germany, uh, this is, they have a very large tides, uh, and you can walk out into the ocean quite a bit. And uh, it's a, a paradise. Uh, it's a paradise for for microscopists, I think. Yeah. Um, can we have a paramecia battle one day? That would be nice uh, to have different paramecia fight each other. Have unfortunately I've not seen them do that. Okay. So um, I move on here. Uh, another question that uh, sometimes uh, appears, uh, my compound microscope's lowest magnification is 40 times and it's uh, way better than uh, the USB microscope. So I just wanna show you what is meant um, with the USB microscope. Yeah, I've made all the videos on this. It's, uh, these are those cheap uh, devices here that can be plugged in um, into um, yeah, a USB port. There is over here um, a um, yeah, brightness control because there are LEDs here, okay? And you, you, you remove the cap and then you focus here, okay? And then what you do is you just you know, put it on, on something and you, you, can, you can observe it. This was really cheap. I got it, uh, yeah, to sell it. Yeah, they're, they're, it's actually one of the lower quality ones. I just wanted to get the cheapest one. Um, and if you do not have a stereo microscope, but you want to see uh, see it a little bit, um, yeah, the surface texture, you can use those. But there is a little bit uh, a thing that I want to show you. I don't know if you're, do you see, yeah, do you see this here? What does it say? Yeah, forty times and a thousand times. And then when you turn this here, what it actually does, it focuses. This is not a magnification change, but what they actually mean is, is if you kind of uh, move it away and then refocus, you can change the size, okay? But actually, it doesn't make sense, okay? Um, you cannot compare um, uh, this type of microscope, either in quality or in appearance, with a, with a compound microscope. Essentially, what this is, you can even take this off here, is, um, is a small lens here um, that kind of, yeah, when you focus, moves in and out. Yeah, there's a small lens here, and, and there is a camera, uh, is a webcam in here, right? Um, so uh, by all means, you see it, the LEDs here. By all means, get a microscope like this uh, to play around with. Uh, it's kind of fun to, to, to look at things, insects and so on, especially with children. It's quite useful, but this is not a, a replacement or cannot even be remotely compared um, to a compound microscope. If you don't want to get a, a stereo microscope, uh, but you kind of still want to see larger opaque objects, yeah, get this here, okay? It's 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 uh, or something similar. Um, yeah, it's kind of fun to use, but yeah, it's an entirely different category. Yeah, so that's why uh, uh, yeah here um, that basically this one is not able to resolve uh, compared to a compound microscope. Yeah, um, so I'm gonna go back to some of the questions here. Are bacteria better visible when staining with methylene blue? Um, uh, shortly uh, said yes. I stained an epithelial cell from a mouth and then noticed a lot of little rods around the cell. Yes, my guess is that these are bacteria. If you if you see them uh, as regular rods, most likely because uh, the number of bacteria in your in a person's mouth is is really high. It would be actually surprised if they were not bacteria. Yeah. Um, so can you show a tutorial on blood smear staining using uh, yeah. Uh, methanol, eosin Y, and methylene blue. Well, I did it with methylene blue already in a video, um, but I can actually do a demonstration on this also. Maybe that's a good live stream topic as well. Uh, blood mic microscopy. Yeah. So thank you for the uh, for the comment. Okay. Uh, 
My microscope is also very cheap. Well, yeah, but you can sometimes even cheap microscopes, if you actually use them properly, you can see surprisingly many things. Those USB microscopes are nice for uh, the garden when you find interesting insects, yes, or, or plants or, or yeah, things like this. It's also nice to kind of explore your skin a little bit like this. Yeah, um, So it gives you a very uncomplicated, immediate access to the microscopic world. Yeah? Should I buy a microscope uh, before leaving... Uh, I would imagine since most scopes are manufactured in China, I would be able to easily buy them in Thailand, which are websites. Um, I don't know so many about the websites. If you change country, just be aware of the power supply, I would say. Okay, be aware that you might have to pay import tax, all of these things. Yeah. So, um, yeah. and just uh, some, some ideas here. So, let's move on a little bit with some other questions here. Okay, this is a classic. Oh, this is uh, such a big... Uh, and, uh, look, if, if there are any emotions in uh, the field of microscopy that uh, go up, then it's the question of uh, what about a used quality microscope of the 1980s versus a, a new one? Okay, let's say that you have Leitz, which was already mentioned before, Leica, Zeiss, very often the German brands, they have a very strong tradition. Um, yeah, but even Olympus or Nikon, let's say a, a good branded microscope from the, let's say, 1980s uh, versus um, a new one, yeah, which were often manufactured in China. And this is where the, the, the emotions really go apart. Uh, it's because it's not an entirely objective decision. Um, and uh, when you simply go into the web forums, microscopy forums, you can see that uh, sometimes the debates can be quite heated concerning this. And uh, every time, and I always say, if every time when there's a controversy about a certain topic, then probably there is a little bit of truth to both sides. And then maybe to a certain extent, this is also a question of taste. And as always, it depends. Um, you cannot really, um, very often um, it said, okay, China microscopes. Are China microscopes or microscopes manufactured in China, are they good? Are they any good? And I'm saying it depends on the microscope. It really, I mean, you, you have uh, from, uh, the full range. Um, yeah, also, uh, I once uh, teach in school when we bought our Leica microscopes for, for our students, a whole set of 20 Leica microscopes several years ago. A German brand, Leica. They were all made in made in China. <laughs> the boxes arrived. They had made in China printed on the box and on the microscope because the company outsourced um, the manufacturing, obviously these days. But this does not mean that the quality is any worse, yeah? because the company takes care that the quality is good. You, so you see, the, um, um, I would say so. That's one thing about China microscopes, and this here, that's another one. Is is um, yeah, conditioned used branded microscope is. Um, you see, if you buy a microscope over eBay, where you, um, which has been used before, you might get a very good value for money, but you might also get microscopes uh, where it's impossible to focus anymore because the lubrication oil has solidified over the years. And if this happens, by no means force turn it, but you have to get the microscope serviced. Um, I actually got a free Olympus CHA microscope from the 1980s uh, once because they were discarding them. I, I grabbed one of them. It was completely not usable because the focus and also the mechanical stage, they would not turn because the oil got solid. Um, I contacted the Olympus uh, service uh, center um, and they serviced the microscope. Um, and it, uh, well, it did cost 200 euros. Yeah. Uh, and yeah almost almost like a new microscope but it's excellent quality for sure yeah so but i said it's a pity if i wouldn't do that so you see there is a lot of of, of personal um preference also to that uh, and some people say well that uh, the modern uh, microscopes these days are way better um, than um, the old ones in optical quality i hear people say something vice versa and i say well it depends Okay, um, yeah, it depends on 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 the yeah on how well is the the used microscope, how well is it uh, maintained. Um, it depends also on the new one. So there are too many other variables involved uh, to say that. And ultimately, sometimes it boils down to that some people um, like simply like to have a good German quality microscope from the 1980s. It says, yeah, and it has a name, has a brand. Why not? Yeah. So there is also this personal attachment, brand identification, maybe. So there are many other variables as well. And yeah, that's fine.
Yeah. So, uh, but I'm um, just uh, addressing this one over here. Is it because it's such a, a um, yeah, in some uh, form, such a hot topic? Yeah. I'm going to go back over here again to some of the questions. Yeah. Have you seen homemade microscopes? I built one. It works great. Homemade microscopes. Um, y yes, I've seen. Um, <laughs> I've I've made one at home out of Lego. Um, but of course I did not make the optics. Uh, so what I simply have done is actually I made a video some many years ago, you know, I'm going to show you here. Um, all I did is, is I, I made a Lego tube yeah, with a correct distance and I connected the, 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 the objective one side and the other hand I dropped in um, the um, eyepiece and it worked. Yeah. And an LED. Um, I, don't, I have it down in my cellar, so maybe next time I can show you. Um, so in that sense, it's quite easy, but of course I'm not making the optics. Um, and then there were some people um, that actually used um, the lenses of those disposable cameras. They're those, uh, they used to have those uh, throwaway film cameras, analog film cameras, disposable ones, and they had small plastic lenses. And some people actually used those plastic lenses also to make microscopes. Yeah, it's a nice project, yeah, but although I've not tried that. Yeah. Um, yeah, are there online keys for identifying fruit flies? I don't know about that. Um, yeah, uh, uh, I don't know about uh, one had. To, we would have to check an entomologist for that. Yeah, uh, I'm a PhD student in systems biology who does a lot of microscopy. So I love your channel. Thank you very much. I wonder if you have ever considered doing some videos about more research based. Okay. Um, um, hmm. I'd need a. I'd need a. I'd need a more sophisticated lab. Um, to actually um, do a little bit more research based uh, things. Um, I've uh, placed the focus of my YouTube channels actually more on the hobby microscopy uh, area and also on um, nature observation. This is kind of a little bit the, the direction that I've decided to take it um, because research can get quite specific uh, uh, quite uh, yeah, some, some time. Research by, uh, such as single molecule, no, oh wow, that's getting advanced, okay? Single molecule microscopy, yeah? How do you spell the name of that author you mentioned whose works were available? Uh, Feusner, F O. I don't. I wonder if I can write it out. Mr. Feusner, he was a. Uh, he passed away a few years ago, um, and uh, you, you got and uh, uh, his on his website you can download a lot. But some of these books are pretty advanced. Okay. Feusner is his last name. Um, he um, yeah he uh, Austrian. Uh, from Salzburg, um, and uh, yeah, he was uh, quite uh, well known um, in, in this field. And I just uh, yeah uh, know him because uh, he he put um, all of uh, yeah his his books uh, online, and you might uh, want to check check that. But uh, I checked some of his books, and uh, they were kind of very <laughs> advanced uh, sometimes. Yeah, so you have to be a little bit selective over here. But Mr. Feusner is is. Uh, uh, a well-known, uh, well-known name in the in the area of uh, um, in the area of um, of protozoology. Yeah, yeah. Um, is microscopy just a hobby for you, or is it part of your profession? <laughs> it's both. Um, in my, uh, I am a biology teacher um, in my real life, so to say. So of course, I teach. Uh, um, I teach. Uh, yeah microscopy also in school and uh, from my training I am a microbiologist but during my university studies of microbiology of course we used microscopes but maybe not to the extent as one would expect them uh, to be used um, because uh, most of the identification of bacteria so I worked in the field of bacteriology we do it we did by DNA studies and also by doing chemical analysis um, of, um, of bacteria yeah and uh, so microscopes were there to kind of quality check. So if we had a, a, a I don't know, a, a, a medium, a culture medium where we were growing bacteria and, a, and I put a droplet of this uh, medium under the microscope and I saw that there were different shapes of bacteria in there, then this is a sign that they do not have a pure culture anymore. I got a contaminant in there because if they're supposed to be round shaped bacteria and all of a sudden they're long rods in there, then it's not pure anymore. And I must have messed up something. And uh, this actually is, uh, so microscopy was very important for very quick quality control of whether we've got contaminants. Yeah? Um, and for characterization. So if, uh, if you discover a new bacterium, of course you have to characterize and you have to say which shape it is. But otherwise, it at least in the field where I was working, it's also always a very important, you cannot generalize. In the field where I was working with bacteria, it did not play such an important role because my research was more directed towards the chemical analysis of bacteria. Yeah. 
Did you mention to use blue fountain ink instead? I'm struggling to source methylene blue. I used blue fountain ink pen, yes. Um, and it works also surprisingly well. Methylene blue, um, yes, you might try the following. Um, there are some, um, I've not tried this yet, okay? But you might be able to buy those tablets um, for children that kind of teach them how to brush their teeth because it, they, it's, a, it's a blue tablet and when they put eat that blue tablet then all of the parts where there are bacteria on their teeth they turn blue okay and then the kids are supposed to brush it off yeah and that contains sometimes uh, yeah yeah stains that stain bacteria another place where you might source methylene blue is, is by uh, shops that, for aquariums because uh, sometimes fish they have a fungal infection and they they will add methylene blue into the water to treat the infection of fish of course it's going to turn the water blue so you got to change the water later on yeah so these are two additional sources that you might want to check or use fountain pen ink not calligraphy ink which contains carbon and soot particles but actual uh, yeah fountain pen ink yeah it might it might also work yeah or you try to find those tablets for the kids for, for, for staining the teeth blue so that they can learn how to brush it off um, or the medicine for, for aquarium fish. Yeah. Um, does curl illumination apply to LED illumination or just, uh, no, also to LED. I've got an, a microscope with LED and curl illumination. So I need to explain this uh, to those of you who don't know what curl illumination is. Um, okay, I'm gonna give you a, a historical. I cannot show you right now uh, directly, easy, or maybe I can. Um, let, let me see um, if I can do that. Uh, no, it doesn't work. Okay, um, in curly illumination, what you have is, is over the lamp, okay, and you have an additional diaphragm. We know about that this one is the diaphragm that we have um, of the condenser, okay, that's right beneath the stage. But um, uh, curler microscopes, what they have is, is they have also over the lamp, uh, they have a special optics over the lamp, and they also have a diaphragm there. Originally, Köhler was invented um, because uh, you have wanted to have a very even illumination of, um, yeah, of your specimen. Why even? Because when they used uh, the old light bulbs with the filament, this gave an uneven illumination. And by the optics um, of the Köhler illumination, you kind of even this out. Now you can say now with LEDs, what's the point? We already have an even illumination because some of the LEDs, they have a really large, uh, bright surface. Um, but curl illumination has another imp very important advantage if you want to make photography and if the specimen is difficult. Um, by closing the diaphragm, or oh, I have to show you here, by closing the diaphragm, you're restricting the light only to the place on the slide which is illuminated. So I've got a slide here. Without curler, the light is gonna shine on this large part here. I mean, maybe I'm exaggerating, but the objective only picks up a very small part here, okay? So there is a lot of stray light and this kind of reduces the contrast. And with curly illumination, by, ch by closing this, this diaphragm, what's gonna happen is, is that, you are, um, that you are actually um, reducing the light only to this place where you're actually looking um, at with the objective. And this is um, an advantage if you want to take pictures and, and uh, if you want to increase the contrast. Yeah, So it's not, oh yeah, I understand the question because originally Köhler was there to even out the irregular illumination of, of, of incandescent light bulbs. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm going to go back here. You can buy methylene blue in aquarium hobby shops. It's used to sterilize the water usually. Ah, yes, yes. Just check concentration is usually very high, okay? Have you uh, noticed Swift Stellar One Pro condenser light isn't centered? Any thoughts on how to fix it? Uh, that's interesting. It's not centered. There should be some screws on there that you might uh, be able to loosen and then maybe um, if the holes are, and then you might be able to shift it. This is actually then a little bit sloppy, uh, sloppily put together. Maybe just put it in and tighten the screws. But normally um, you can try to quickly, not take it out completely, but try to loosen the screws and maybe you're able to shift it horizontally. But I'll check um, on, on my microscope if this is possible, yeah? Um, okay, cool. Uh, Printer ink, uh, printer ink never tried that, okay. Um, got it, thanks, okay, yeah. No screws, okay, I have to check it, yeah. 
draw a pic of the slide hard to see your glass. Okay, um, yeah. So um, basically the whole question about curler illumination was the following. Okay, where is a pen? And let me get a sufficiently dark pen. This is uh, basically the, the microscope slide. Okay, and uh, over here there is, uh, the, let's say, the cover glass, okay, and uh, without Köhler illumination, the, and uh, with the condenser, okay, um, in play, only the condenser, what's going to happen is, is that uh, the condenser is going to make a, um, yeah, let's say it's going to illuminate this part here, yeah, and that's going to be bright, but the objective will only pick up a very small part here. So there is more light on the slide than necessary. And this causes um, yeah, yeah, light rays to bounce around into the objective, even though they did not come directly from beneath. So this reduces contrast. And with curly illumination, you're actually able to adjust this uh, uh, yeah, the, the light beam only to the place where the objective is able to pick it up. Okay. Yeah. Okay. For the love of God, leave, uh, yeah. Okay, so let me uh, move on here. So this was Mr. Feusner. Yeah, another interesting question over here um, is um, concerning oil immersion, okay? Um, as I'm, if you remember, I mentioned you put an oil immersion, you put a droplet of oil on here and then you, you, with the oil immersion objective, you can actually rotate it into the oil. Um, and I always said it's cleaning is a little bit of a mess and might not be worth it. So why not use water? And indeed there are so-called water, um, there are water um, immersion objectives that can actually use water. Um, and uh, some I've even seen a company that uh, makes objectives where you can alternatively use water or oil. Um, so why don't you just generally use water? And the answer is uh, because of the refractive index of the water. Um, it's not high enough. And therefore, if you want to get the maximum clarity, you have to use oil because this oil has a higher refractive index. And therefore, you get a better resolution. And, and that's the reason. Yeah. So, um, but water might is better than nothing, yeah? but uh, you, so you have to check whether, um, yeah, I don't know if it's a good idea to use, uh, um, yeah, if it's oil tight, it should also be water tight, but uh, the oil immersion objectives are actually designed with uh, oil, with a refractive index of oil. Yeah, yeah so yes, uh, this, uh, these are water, some water immersion objectives, I even have heard this is, you can actually <laughs> dip them directly into um, a small Petri dish, uh, to do observation. Yeah? So even that is, uh, some objectives are able to do that. For example, um, when you want to observe uh, cell culture where the cells are in liquid, yeah? but uh, this is, uh, you, the objectives have to be completely watertight, of course. Yeah. Okay, so um, that's this question here. Uh, what time is it? I'm checking the time all the time. Wow, it's almost 50 minutes, okay. Um, yeah, so uh, I've got here another question that I found. By the way, these questions were posted on, on my YouTube channel and I kind of uh, copied them, yeah. Um, let me see um, how to clean slides. Okay, I'm just gonna talk about this so maybe. I have a problem concerning pond water samples. Uh, while they're very interesting and are filled with life, sooner or later bacteria start to colonize the jar and form large white clumps um, in the water. I do not understand why this happens as it only takes a matter of days to occur. Okay, I do not feed the sample, but just uh, put it next to the window. Okay, a um, couple of suggestions. Yes, um, first of all, it is normal if you have a water jar, um, it is normal that, of course, the composition of microorganisms changes over time because uh, the temperature and, and, and light and, and so on in here is not the same um, as out there in the pond. But generally, uh, leave the sample open because as soon as you close it off, it's going to become anaerobic. And the larger microorganisms, like for example, ciliates, maybe some worms and so on, they need a lot of oxygen. And they are the ones that actually eat the bacteria. So what could have, maybe what happened is, is that for whatever reason, um, you essentially um, you have lost the top predators of the food chain. You lost those organisms possibly that actually eat up the bacteria. 
Yeah? Um, because bacteria, some of them um, can survive with less oxygen, but those ciliates and the larger um, you know, the organisms they, which remove the bacteria, they need a lot of oxygen. So make sure that you, the oxygen concentration remains high. And if you keep it next to the window, what can happen also is, yes, the algae, they do photosynthesis. That's pretty nice. They make oxygen, but it could also that the temperature rises. And uh, if the temperature is higher, then the water is not able to uh, be saturated so much with oxygen. The oxygen is more driven out and the oxygen level can again drop. So you see, it's a delicate issue. So I would suggest is um, that maybe you keep it bright, but in a cool place um, and without direct sunlight. Um, simply to make sure that the oxygen concentration is it remains high. And it could be that some of the water samples essentially, yeah, you kind of, for whatever reason, you lost the top predators of the tiny food chain in here. And you say you don't feed it, that's good. But um, yeah, you see all of those algae, that's also food for bacteria, yeah? like, like in this case here. Yeah? So, so a few other things, how to clean slides because there might be harmful microbes from the stagnant water source. Um, let's put it this way, when I collect a, when the pond is reasonably clean and when you might go swimming in there and I collect a water sample from there, um, I don't mind directly so much because yeah, I'm swimming in there anyway. Um, it's more of a problem if it starts to smell bad and starts to decompose. Okay, so this is then, of course, um, you've got to be for general hygienic reasons, you just want to be more careful. I'm not saying it's automatically more dangerous. Uh, if you have spoiled food in your refrigerator, I mean, all of the spores of the mold and so on, that's not healthy either, right? But that's why you want to have general hygienics. Yeah? Um, and the question is now is if uh, what do you do if, uh, for example, you have now, um, I don't know, a slide over here, there's some there's a water sample on here, and let's say bacteria, I'm not so much worried about most of the protozoa, I know there's some protozoa that might be problematic. Yeah, there are certain parasitic protozoa. But yeah, you see, not to be automatically expected. But if you've got bacteria in there at a high concentration, you also don't have to assume that they're dangerous, but I don't like the high concentration so much, right? Now you put a sample on here, uh, and now what? What do you do now? Um, so what you can do, of course, is you can simply let it dry. Many bacteria will die out because of that. Some bacteria will form spores maybe, or are able to withstand it anyway. So the question is, what do you do? Uh, if you don't want to dump it away, what you can do, of course, you can uh, work with bleach. You can work with hot water, hot boiling water. You can work with hydrogen peroxide or you can dump al alcohol over it. Okay, so there are um, uh, several possibilities. Yeah, uh, I don't know. Uh, hand sanitizer that's used nowadays uh, during the Corona times yeah? works pretty effective. Yeah? Uh, something that you should not be doing <laughs> because I'm going to make a video. What about vinegar or other acids? Yeah, they also kill bacteria, but not as effectively. So if you're concerned, don't use vinegar. Yes, I will release a, a video um, about this, about the disinfecting um, effect of vinegar. It does kill bacteria, but not as effectively. Okay. So, so clean slides. Uh, pay attention to the soil food web if you want uh, to breed healthy soil. Yeah, sure. How often do you find use for your stereoscope? Or do you focus primarily on microscopes? Okay, yes, I do have a stereo uh, scope and um, I occasionally use it. And I will tell you why I occasionally use it. Because I will sometimes use my compound microscope for top illumination. So uh, basically what I do is uh, with the four times, and this is a 40 times objective over here, right? But with a four times objective with the lowest magnification, what I do is I place a small insect or a sample on here, look at it with a four times objective, but I have light shining from the top by using a flashlight, okay? I don't even have a flashlight here now, okay? No, you, I use a flashlight shine from the top and this also works. Yeah? Because um, with a four times low power uh, objective, it works fine. Yeah. So um, in that sense, I sometimes don't even need my stereo microscope because I'm just working with my compound microscope, but I'm kind of using it a little bit in a different way. Yeah. Simply also looking at the object from top by having a flashlight from, from the top. Yeah. Um, so um, resource for learning about microbial ecology. Oh my gosh, these are microbial ecology is uh, a big topic. <laughs> Resources, I mean, there, uh, I'd have to check some books. Uh, there are textbooks um, on this, yeah? And it's a huge topic, 
Yeah, it's yeah, and with many sub areas, biodegradation, microbial ecology, and and so on. Yeah, use dentists autoclave. Why not? Autoclave is autoclave. You can use. We use them also a pressure cooker, which is used for cooking food. Okay, that's that's also possible. Yeah. Um, in washing liquid solution in ISO alcohol, wash and rinse under running water, then wash in distilled water and then dry them. Yeah, why not? The alcohol is the thing that actually kills the bacteria. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, so, and the next thing is, yeah, I just have maybe two more questions uh, because I'm already talking all, almost an hour. Um, this was also a recent one. I love your videos. I think you forgot to mention the big disadvantage of using DSLR cameras, like I have over here, yeah. um, that, um, for, for microscopy. And that is you always need to worry about low battery and low memory storage. In the microscope camera, you don't have to worry about those. There are those dedicated microscope USB cameras that you put into a microscope. And uh, yeah, they get the power supply over the USB cable. And when you take a picture, then the picture is directly saved on the computer. And these, those DSLR cameras, I show you what I have done, is the following, and you might not know that, because this uh, actually solves the problem of the power supply, because this here is not a battery, but this is, it has the size of a battery, but it has a cable connected to it, okay? And this actually plugs in into an adapter. So um, I have solved the problem of the power supply because it is a problem when you do time lapse, Okay, you want to watch some crystals growing. This takes, I don't know, half an hour maybe yeah, um, for them to grow. And then, of course, there is indeed the problem. The battery runs out. Happens to me, happens to me, right? And for this reason, I bought myself uh, this here. And it goes into the DSLR camera. Uh, if I can get it in again. Yeah. And there is even a little, uh, a little, that's why they already made a little cutout here. I don't know if you can see it. Yeah. So that you, the cable can go out here. Yeah. And what about the other side? Where is what, how does the other side look like? And on the other side, you have this. Okay. Yeah, you can even also plug it in and, and use. Yeah. So, um, so the power supply has been solved. Um, and uh, concerning um, the running out of memory, this also happened to me. So it is a legitimate thing. Um, and of course, besides using a larger uh, SD card, there is, uh, especially for Canon and Nikon cameras, uh, there is a software available called for tethered shooting. So this means I can actually uh, have the possibility to um, to control the camera over the um, um, yeah, USB and then also to uh, to then also download or take pictures into the computer. I've never tried that actually, but it should work to actually also use the camera to take pictures into the computer. Yeah. Yeah, so um, that is uh, simply something uh, with uh, some Canon uh, cameras, uh, it will recognize, it will recognize that it is not an original adapter and will actually display a warning of whether you actually want to continue, but then it works. Yeah, so I, I only work with, with those uh, power adapters. Yeah. Uh, um, so this question answers very cool. Do it again. Thank you very much. Uh, if, it, uh, if you like it, your style of engaging is very unique and relaxing. <laughs> Thank you as well. It's good to get positive feedback. If people like uh, this type of stuff, then then that's good, okay? Uh, the difficult is, difficulty is always, uh, if I don't have, I was kind of worried, are there gonna be enough questions? Do I know the answers? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I talked about the bacteria already. I think I'm running out of questions now, yeah? So, about low battery. So that's, that, these are all the questions that I have. So, um, I would suggest you uh, ecology of protozoa, the biology of free living, oh yeah. It's nice. There's so many recommendations here. Just an idea. You could open a uh, postal box so that the viewers could send you some permanent slides of your collection and renew them uh, live. Oh, that is a nice thing. That's a nice idea. People sending me slides. I, as a matter of fact, uh, some time ago, was actually thinking about something. And I don't know. I'm just going to propose it here. Um, not that I'm able to set it up. But you see... <laughs> I know that there is uh, this website called Book Crossing where people can send each other used books for, for reading. Um, and I said, that's actually pretty cool. Wouldn't it be kind of nice to do something similar with microscope slides? You kind of send each other microscope slides. So for example, if someone is very good at making certain microscope slides, uh, then maybe you have some kind of a, a trade platform. And maybe I like to make microscope slides of, I don't know, sand samples and somebody else makes microscope slides of, I don't know, <laughs> something else, yeah? Uh, insects or I don't know, uh, pollen. 
And it would be kind of interesting to have some kind of a platform where it's possible to kind of trade those slides and, and, and send them across just for the fun of it. Yeah, it would be kind of uh, just an idea. Um, I, I wouldn't know how to implement that. Uh, yeah, you'd need some kind of a, a trading platform for this, uh, but uh, just an idea. Yeah. Um, so uh, thank you so much for uh, yeah rekindling my interest in microscopy. By the way, rekindling the interest in microscopy. Just also in this channel, um, I made uh, just recently a video um, on um, about maintaining the motivation for microscopy because this is actually a, a topic that uh, reappears every now and then. Is um, yeah you you're very enthusiastic at the beginning. Um, by the way, I'm also kind of talking a little bit from my own experience here. Uh, you buy yourself a microscope with enthusiasm and after a couple of weeks, the enthusiasm kind of wears out a little bit. You've seen all of your slides. Um, yeah, you go out, get a pond water sample. You already know a little bit what to expect. So there is indeed the possibility that the excitement starts to fade. That's completely normal. It's pretty much with any activity. And one of the reasons why this happens, and I think, is it's because you've learned something. Every time when you learn something, um, yeah, it's new at the beginning. There's excitement and then, yeah, you've been doing the whole thing now over and over and over again. So it is actually indeed the case that uh, with time, the interest in a certain activity, pretty much any activity can wear out happened to me as well. And that's why I decided a few years ago, actually, um, yeah, I'm going to start a YouTube channel simply to explore or expand my, my hobby a little bit. And this basically where I ended up is now basically giving advice to other folks and, and having an exchange here. Yeah. So you don't know how it develops, but it, um, so you kind of keep on learning new things. Um, and that's simply the recommendation that I have. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's in the slide of the coronavirus. Oh, that's also a very common question um, about uh, people want to see viruses under the microscope. And with light microscopes, unfortunately, this is not possible. They are too small. The coronavirus is too small. It's not even physically possible to resolve them because the wavelength of light is, is, is uh, too large. Yeah? Given people live in different geographical locations, it may interest some too. Yeah. Here we treat all theories as potential. That's why you come. To, okay, there's a conversation going on. Many thanks for you in well comments. Yeah, I saw your motivation video. It is excellent. Thank you for doing it. <laughs> yes, thank you for the thank. Thank you for the thank you. Um, yeah, um, I, I keep, I'll keep on making videos. Obviously, uh, so uh, it's not uh, such a difficult thing. I just the most difficult thing is not making the videos. Actually, coming up with topics. Yeah. So this is the the. the the difficult thing. This also was also one of the reasons why I decided to make it this live stream um, type of uh, yeah video because it allows me to immediately respond to questions that people have and and we have a little bit of a community and this I hope this drives motivation and I hope you're all having a little bit of fun here. Yeah? So, but you know what? Over one hour on already. Okay. Um, enjoy the live stream. Hope you enjoy doing. Them. I really love doing them. Um, I want to continue to do them um, usually around the same time every week uh, because it's most convenient for me. If for whatever reason I don't do them, then something must have come into in the way um, a little bit. But generally, I have I see no reason to stop them <laughs> because uh, they're easy to make now that everything's set up. Okay, yeah? I don't have to do any editing um, and anything. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, I want to thank all of you for, for being here. Um, yeah, uh, hopefully see you again next week. Um, I have to think of a topic, obviously. Um, but um, yeah, stay tuned. Um, yeah, and uh, uh, keep checking back again. And uh, if you have any comments um, after I stop the live stream, it will take some time for the video to appear online. And then you can post all the regular comments beneath it. and. Uh, um, then you can also post some questions or some additional comments that you might have. But uh, for, yeah, I'll quickly read the last few comments here. Thank you for the live stream. Do live stream microscopy. I stream to my friends from time to time. Yes, um, as a matter of fact, live streaming microscopy is also something that I have already done. Okay, I can actually, uh, I have a, a microscope connected. I have done this in my other channel, but I've switched over now to this channel. So I, everything's set up to actually do live stream microscopy as well. Yeah. Thank you very much. I love your channel. Thank you very much. I want to thank all of you. I want to wish you a nice week. And uh, yeah, I have to say happy microbe hunting as always. <laughs> and uh, see you around next time. Okay. See you around. Bye.